You're about to hear a brief conversation with an incredible artist. Part autobiographical journey, part literary analysis, and part late night chat in the theatre bar. This is Hear Me Out. And I'm your host, Lucy Eaton. Please welcome to the stage, Joanna Vanderham. That sounds like it's coming through the mic. I think it is. I think I'm good at that. Oh my God, brilliant. We did it. We made Woo-hoo. it. We did it. I think it's funny because we're however many years into doing so much stuff online and I still find I can't have a single interaction online without something going wrong. I mean, totally. I mean, bless my poor publicist because like every time they're calling me being like, Joe, Joe, are you there? And I'm like, I just had to like update or my mic isn't working. Or like, it's so just, you're like, surely this would be easy. It's been three years. Exactly. So before we launch into the major question, how are you doing? You're producing now. Yeah, that's the plan. That's the plan. And that's screen though, isn't it? That's Not screen. Theater. That's screen. Yeah. But I mean, I've oh got, I mean, I want to start producing theatre as well because I just, I just love it. Like I love being on stage and working in that, in that capacity. So to be honest, I'm sort of just looking for good stories and then I think what makes a good producer is knowing where that fits. Yeah, not forcing it into a medium that it doesn't suit. Yeah. But okay, let's get on to the speech. The speech. The reason we're all here. The reason we're all here. The reason we've gathered here today. (laughs) So can you just start off by saying what play it's from and telling us a little bit about the play? This is a a monologue from the third act of a incredible play called The Promise, which was originally written by Alexei Arbutsov. I think that's how we pronounce it. Great. And the version that I was in was adapted by Penelope Skinner in 2012. Mm -hmm. And um, it follows the lives of three people who survive the siege of Leningrad in Russia during the Second World War. So we meet them when they are teenagers, so they're sort of 16, 17 years old, and we stay with them over the course of the next, what's that, 17 years? And they're the way that we kind of understand about the war and yeah. what it was like for millions of people. We kind of focus on these three three people. And I played Lika, who um, it was the only woman in the play. I was fortunate enough to see it. I saw your production and it was fabulous. Oh, you did? So, um, oh, amazing. Yeah, I remember it. And it's a bit of a love triangle. Well, I say a bit of a love triangle. It's an extreme love triangle, isn't it? It is. And, and I think it's love in so many different senses. So it's mm. it's not just a romantic love. It's So Lika in the, in the opening act has been living in this abandoned apartment for weeks by herself. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden Marat crashes in and he says well this is my this is my house and you 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 she said why are you here this is my house and uh, and that's the beginning of their kind of um bickering and their back and forth and once Leonidic arrives it gives them a focus it gives them a kind of attention and so mm. the initial dynamic is almost mother father baby right because Leonidic is in such a bad way when he arrives and what happens is that that dynamic kind of sticks and so even though they may I mean they all do love each other Mm -hmm. it's it's not love in that conventional kind of let's marry and have kids kind of way it's just it's a much a much deeper they're all kind of orphaned they 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 need this family this kind of made-up family to get through the war and then they think they need it to kind of get through the rest of their lives and that is what is essentially challenged that's the question that is raised by the play what happens in that third act where does this monologue come from and why do you love it so much so the third act is 1959 and the so you the audience kind of are supposed to feel that Lika is going to end up with Marat, who is the first boy that comes in. The father, the father, mother. The father, father, mother, exactly. Yeah. And what has happened is Marat has left and uh, Lika actually ends up with Leonidic. So we meet them and they are still living in this same apartment that they lived in during the war. It's one room. 
and they haven't done anything with their lives and I mean in in the sense that when they were kids they said I'm gonna be a concert pianist Mm, and mm. he's gonna be a world famous poet Mm. and they've sort of settled and they, they they're fine with that they seem fine and then Marat comes back out of absolutely nowhere and essentially says you know I've been in a bad way I shouldn't have left I I've I made a mistake you mean everything to me you meaning Lika or you meaning both of you both of them so mm. they they both yeah both and then basically Leonidic is the one who says well I've re- I've realized that we're not Lika and I were not good for each other because we haven't pushed each other we haven't achieved anything and so then Marat turns to Lika and says well, it's up to you now. You you choose. <laughs> She's just like, how dare you? How dare you both use me like a pawn in your lives? And then and then she starts her speech. First of all, I guess I'd be quite interested to know how quickly when I asked if you'd come on the show, how quickly did you think of this? Did it come to mind straight away or did you have to sort of think back through stuff you'd done? I did. I did think back. I also considered plays that I haven't been in. Um, mm-hmm. And it was a wonderful opportunity to just go and read stuff. But I wanted to choose something that not only was a great speech, but also kind of felt relevant in that, like, this was the first ever play that I did publicly. And I remember speaking to the director about why he cast me. And he was like, yeah, you were so green. Like, you were such... Like, I came into the audition and... Uh, they'd already cast the character Marat. So he was there on the recall audition. Brilliant, Max Bennett. Yes, wonderful. And such a generous actor. And we had this uh, scene together that was the rehearsal, the, the audition scene, where we're having this picnic and we're eating this food. And I remember just like grabbing bits of stuff that was like in the audition room and like laying it down on the ground and not thinking twice about the fact that that's how we would rehearse the scene. Yeah. And then afterwards, the director was just like, you were mad as a box of frogs. You were just like opening stuff in the rehearsal room. And I was like, am I not allowed to do that? To do that? (laughs) Like, I didn't realise. You know what? That's so interesting to hear because I was just talking to someone last weekend about the fact that I had this sort of revelation moment when I was in my maybe like mid to late 20s. Like, I'd been out of drama school for about three or four years and, you know, I'd had a few really nice jobs, but my career wasn't going in the way that I hoped it would. And I had this sudden moment, like light bulb moment that I was like, I'm going into auditions and I'm really like behaving myself. Mm. I'm being very polite and I'm not saying I should go in and be rude or that I should go in and be wacky for the sake of being wacky. But I was like, I am going into every audition and I can see the moment I step across that threshold, I actually sort of wash away any personality I have and I treat it a bit like an interview and I go in Mm. and I'm like hello yes lovely to meet you hi I'm Lucy and and then I read the lines and hopefully I read them believably but I ultimately don't give them any reason to think that I'm absolutely the right choice over someone else like as we know Mm. certainly in this industry the problem isn't just competition the problem is brilliant competition everyone's great You know, like there's so many brilliant people and it's never about, oh, that person got that because they're a better actor than you. Yeah. And I was suddenly like, I need to go in and just be unashamedly, unabashed me, whatever the hell that is. Yeah. And then that's the hardest bit. Yeah. Because as actors, we get lines to say. We have other people's beautiful words that, you know, it's like um, that incredible speech in people, places and things. You know, I get given all these incredible words and. Yes. Then when it comes to to being yourself, it's like, well, who is that? Yeah, and Denise Goff talked about that in series one of the show. Denise (gasps) Goff did that speech. Oh, incredible. It's so interesting. You have to listen to that episode. It's so good. But yeah, so so sorry, we went on a really great tangent there. But back (laughs) to Luca. So when you landed on this, yeah, you were like, this had a personal resonance as well because it was your first job. Yeah, and basically this this speech, this speech wasn't in the play that I read. This this only appeared in draft five. Oh. So we'd been rehearsing for a couple of weeks. Wow. And yeah. And they they the producers, because um, it was it was on at um the Trafalgar Studios. Trafalgar Studios. Yeah. 
thank you. But it was <laughs> produced by the Don Mar. So, so yeah. it was like the the Don Mar producers and um, had been sitting down with Penelope and saying, you know, we've seen a version of it and we think it needs X Y Z. I wasn't privy to that mm. conversation, so I don't know exactly yeah. what happened. But that afternoon, we got told by by Alex Sims, the director, you know, we're going to get a rewrite this evening, and. I opened this email and I and I read the speech and I just couldn't stop crying. Yeah, yeah. And at this point I was incredibly invested in the characters. And it was just this beautiful gift of a a deeper self for Lika. It was it was like I understand who she is now. Giving her a voice. Giving her a voice and I was so I was so excited and grateful and I came into rehearsals the next day and Max and Gwillem Lee, who plays Leonidic, they just came over and they were like, Joe, <laughs> Joe. You, and I was like, I know. And, I, know, and right? Al- I know, right? And so Alex, the director was just like, okay, guys, like, we're going to, we're going to do it. Going to do that scene. And we did the, the scene from the, from the beginning. Yeah. And I, I don't think I'd even said it out loud. Mm. But anyway, so I I got there and I sat. We we did we did the scene and I ended up sitting at the table, mm. and I delivered the entire speech from my chair. And I I just let the words be the words and do the work. Yeah, yeah. And I looked up and, and just everyone was just gone. And I had a moment, I was like, I think that was the right choice. <laughs> and <laughs> and then we sort of chatted about it and I said, look, well, maybe I move around. Maybe I do stand up and I I should give it, you know. And so we, we, we did the scene again and I got up and I and I moved around. And it was like, no, you, you had so much more power as a stationer because that's what she'd been doing. She stayed. That's yeah. what the, that, sh- they went off and they got to be heroes and and she stayed and it just grounded me and it gave me this this real gravitas i think and it was so that was a real a moment in trust your instincts and yes yes it's okay to then go on and question them and decide they really were the first the first thing was the best thing to do but just to to have that that freedom that confidence to trust the words yes i've heard a of- great bit of advice from Michael Grandage in the past one of your main jobs as a director is to not get in the way of actors doing great things and it's like that moment it's like if you sit there and just deliver it and actually it's right first time that's okay like that can happen you don't need to change something for the sake of changing something and I think as an audience member you can spot it a mile off when someone when a director has changed something for the sake of changing it it's interesting because um, we had I had a moment like that with Simon in the Dazzle. Mm. So Andrew was giving his speech. Sorry to interrupt there, Joe. Just for clarity mm-hmm. for the listener. So Simon is Simon Evans, theatre director yes. and screenwriter, and also my brother. And uh, Andrew is Andrew Scott. Yes, absolutely incredible, Andrew Scott. Please carry on. But I just wanted to watch him, Andrew, and it did. Yeah. It did mean. <sighs> That my back was to the audience yeah, because yeah. it was on three sides. And I just, I, I, my character was falling in love with him. And I just didn't want to take my eyes off him. And Simon was like, please, like, we need to see you. We need to see your face. <laughs> and I was like, sure, like, I, I'll, I'll try. But it's, it, it's very difficult. Yeah, because it doesn't feel right. I'm then not looking at him. Yeah. Anyway, so so we tried it, and Simon came over and said, "No, you look at him. You, abs- <laughs> you just <laughs> you look at him." And I thought I just I just fell in love with Simon. I just thought that's I I have so much respect for that. For yeah, it, a rehearsal room being about you know different ideas coming together and trying things. Let's try this, but ultimately you might have been right. Yeah, and being okay just to say, "Oh no, it was like that works and it's lovely and yeah, and let's let's keep doing it." Oh, I mean, that's one of the phrases I've picked up from my brother most is my bum steer. Because <laughs> he'll always say that, you know, he'll do something, he'll go, that was my bum steer, that was my bum, no, 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 no. ignore me, ignore me, you were right. <laughs> but there's so much confidence that, that he must, you know, have to be able to just admit that. And I think I have so much respect for that. Mm. 
Okay, so, so many more questions. If I understand it correctly, based on what you just said, is this a totally original Penelope Skinner, as in there was no version of this in the original Russian version? Yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's like the polar opposite of the nightmare where, like, a lot of the time you do tech for a play, don't you? And it's like three and a half hours long at the beginning of the previews. And they're like, this cannot be three and a half hours long. And so every day the director's coming and going, okay, guys, like, we're cutting scene three or, like, we're cutting this part of scene. And you're always like, not my lines, not my lines. And it's not about, like being showy it's that like you've already said a lot of the time you're so attached to the character that actually to remove lines feels like but how will people possibly understand if they don't see the character say that stuff um so that's nice that you've had the opposite there a lot of like the the line learning process is is learning the thought process so why do i say this Mm. and what is it about what the other person has said that means this is the only thing I can say in response? And so by cutting lines that you've already learned, you're interrupting the thought process. But that's just the jo- one of the jobs of an actor. Yeah, of course. I've, I've just done a, a, a TV series just now that the finished article is quite different to what we filmed. And I was sent an early draft and I was like what have you done? Like, I was I was so confused and I really missed the stuff that they'd cut. And then I got to watch it again last week, which was like six months later. And I was like, oh, it's really good. That's really, really good. <laughs> and I literally missed nothing. And I was like, God, that's hats off to the producers because they, knew. they were as close to the project as me at the time. And yet they still had that objectivity. Yeah. I think it's very hard as an actor to have that. And that's why you have different people do different roles, right? Because I think as an actor, you're so in it. Your job is to make sense of everything a character is doing to the best of your ability, to love that character no matter how despicable they are. You're so on their side. You're so on their side. So I think it's totally fine that as an actor, we don't have the objectivity to be like, yeah, you don't need that. So how did you find, you said this was your first professional theatre job. Mm. Obviously, Trafalgar Studios is like a super intimate, it was the downstairs space, wasn't it? Which is really, really tight now was that more overwhelming or in a way was it like more like a screen job that's an interesting question I mean I'm trying to think back to whether I was sort of thinking of it in that way because in drama school we'd been doing theatre we didn't we had like one term on Mm. telly and I kind of always thought I would be a theatre actress rather than a telly actress the idea of being on stage and in front of a live audience didn't actually scare me yeah. as much as like I look back at my early career on screen and I'm like it's probably quite good that I was so naive because I would have otherwise been totally terrified and probably incapacitated yeah, yeah. oh my god absolutely and, like I just got on with it so how did can I ask a bit about that you mm-hmm. went off and did your first professional screen job while you were at drama school yeah I mean they were amazing about it so what point in drama school was it that you went and how long like was it just leaving early or was it in the middle it was in the middle so I was in my second year mm. and um I went to Royal Welsh College and so our head of acting was aware of the fact that we didn't have a huge turnout at the um the plays because it's difficult to persuade people to come to Wales when they can't get home at the end of the day so he was really really diligent about having industry professionals come to do workshops and like they would come in for a day or they would come in and do like a a course like five days Mm. or whatever so the casting director her name was Emma Style really tragically she kind of she passed away um oh gosh I know very young um I basically owe her my whole career and it's very sad. Yeah. So she came in and her, so she was there to teach us how to audition for screen. Mm -hmm. And she did that thing of like, you've got two different scripts and just pick the one that suits you best. And it was like, do you know your own casting? We, we had to find a partner and we, we sat opposite and did, you know, my audition, then your audition. And then she sat us all down and she made, just watch them back on this giant screen and just critiqued everyone and it was awful. And like she honestly, she was just like, You chose the wrong speech, you were dreadful. Oh like God. you didn't even look up. Like she was brutal. And then it came to me and she I think she said something as banal as like, You chose the right speech. 
and like you were and fine. You're like, oh my god, thank and, god. Like compared to everyone else, it was like I'd give, been given an Oscar. Like honestly, <laughs> it was just she was so harsh. But I mean, incredible because yeah, that's that's so probably helpful. the feedback that we needed. Mm. And then a few months later, I think it was about three or four months later, she was casting a show called The Runaway, which mm. was a company pictures production for Sky, and apparently they'd been searching for their uh, female lead for a really long time and they hadn't managed to find them and she called my head of acting and said can that blonde girl with the funny surname come and do an audition <laughs> is that literally so I think what, she, she said? <laughs> what she said oh my god so I think she was really scraping the barrel and I luckily I mean it was like one of these kind of in, uh, such a lucky moment so basically we'd been learning accents and we'd been learning how to learn an accent so mm-hmm you then have that as your sc- as your skill rather than you can only do four accents. And so our job was to go and find someone and and learn their accent. I'd found someone, I think it was my hairdresser who was from Essex. Great. And so I was learning an Essex accent, which meant I had the basics of the Cockney accent pretty much down pat. And then I found out that I had the audition and the head of, of voice was doing private one-on-one lessons with me on how to do a Cockney accent the head of acting was doing private one-on-one lessons with me on how to do the scene, like scene yeah. study. That is so amazing. It's like you have this team of Royal Welsh scholars behind you. I know. And like, then I hear stories about schools that are like, no, you're not ready. You can't work professionally yet. And I just feel so lucky that that was yeah. not their attitude. You know, they were, they were sort of of the attitude that if an industry professional that we respect thinks you're ready, who are we to stand in your way? And I'm so grateful because then I, I I got it and I didn't have an agent. Emma had to call me directly and tell me that I'd got the job. And That's so she cool. was like, this is such a lovely moment because normally she's just speaking to agents. How many auditions did you have to do? Two, just two. Oh my God. Like, I know, right. kind of madness. And I remember at one point I got a phone call from the costume designer when I was in the cafeteria and I went outside to the hallway and was like taking this call and I came back in and I said who it was. And, and one of the girls, very understandably, still a good friend, was like, I'm so jealous. Yeah. And I realised before I even left, when it comes to this job, speak when spoken to. You will only lose friendships with this. Anyway, so I, I went and I did the job and I came back. Yeah. It was actually Alan Cumming said to me when we were working, you've got to go back. Like, finish that what training. What do you get out of leaving? Yeah. He's like, go and do five plays. You will. He basically said, you'll never in your career get to do five plays back to back like that again. That is so true. Oh, my God, that's so good. What a gift, you know? So I went back and quite rightly, I was cast as like the walk-on part in the first play. I was like, this tiny role might as well have not existed. And then I was given a couple of really juicy roles, which I then also looked at for this. I thought, because I played Mary Stewart, which was very cool. And so that was a contender. And I played the blonde in Hitchcock Blonde, which was also a contender for this. But the, I mean, the state of the world at the moment just made this one feel so incredibly more relevant with everything that's going on in Ukraine. Yeah. And it really makes me feel like there it's about human people. It's about it's about real people. Yeah. It's yeah. something really fascinating that that rereading the promise has kind of uh reminded me that we are we we try and I I hope this is what it is, that we try and protect ourselves. That a murder in civilian life is called something else when you're at war a death a series of deaths are called something else when there's a pandemic it's removed you are always trying to remove and essentially again another thing that really resonated with me with this play is does that work Can we bury it? Can we choose to forget? Although, of course, as well, like the speech, which we have to hear in a second, Mm -hmm. is so interesting because it's like you say as well about carrying on. It's the greatest square peg to fit inside a circular hole of humanity, which is like, how do you stay human, stay sympathetic, stay empathetic? 
And also, like you say about removing yourself, remove yourself enough to be able to function. Yeah. And actually, I wanted to share one thing before we hear the speech, which was that when I read it, it really reminded me of a play called The Violet Hour, which is also by Richard Greenberg, who wrote The Dazzle, which you mentioned yeah. earlier. Yeah. And in that, there's a conversation about like the definition of the word gay as the word used to be used. And this, char- and this for me felt exactly like the speech we're about to hear that you've picked. It's a man talking about existing in between the two world wars if you knew the second one was going to happen, right? Oh, wow. And he says, to be gay is to be lighthearted in the face of every kind of darkness, to insist on one's own happiness when God or the forces of chaos rally to oppose it, to fill a void, to make a void a niche, to understand that the future is at best bleakness deferred and to go on. And I just thought that is so akin to sort of what Lika's saying in this speech, which is like, we have to find a way to function. Um, Right, can we hear this beautiful speech? Yes. So Marat has come back after 13 years and um, Lika, he always sends a telegram on her birthday and this year he didn't. And so she thought something had happened to him. And he comes in triumphant and says, well, if I'd sent a telegram, you wouldn't have been so pleased to see me. So, so arrogant. <laughs> and and then Leonidic says, yes, I'm leaving. I'm leaving you guys to it. And Marat turns to Lika and says, there, uh, you know, I, uh, what happens now is up to you. And And this is what she says. I see. It's up to me again, is it? Lucky me. Well, I tell you what, Marat, thank you so much for your insights about life and fear, and maybe you're right. We should try and remember 42 more often, shouldn't we? We should try and think of it, and remember the unfortunate people who didn't make it, like the Vexlers, or your sister, or our parents, maybe. Maybe we should spend every day thinking about all the people who starved, or froze, or got hit by shells and blown into a thousand pieces or the number of times we saw someone on the street and we knew they were dying and we didn't do anything to help them because all we could think about was getting home and trying to get warm or maybe we should think more often about the dead bodies we cleaned off the floors of the apartments or the men who surrounded our city who hated us so much Men who never met us, never seen our faces. We should wonder, where are they now? Are they doing normal jobs and going home to their wives and listening to music and making love and having children? Is that a good thing to think about? Should I think about that? Or maybe that's too abstract. I should be more specific. Okay. Well then, how about I start thinking about the Vexler's cat? (laughs) Who I loved. And who kept me company. Well, I was here alone, but one day I got so hungry that I killed her and cooked her and ate her. Should I think about that? Because you know something? I don't think I want to. I prefer to believe in the siege as they told us it happened after the war. The official version the kindness of strangers, the willing and noble sacrifice of the citizens of a glorious and patriotic city. Because like you always used to say, Marat, before you walked out on us the first time, pretending you believe is almost as good as actually believing, isn't it? Thank you so much for, like, really doing that. (laughs) (laughs) It's hard really not to, especially there. when you've played mm. someone. It stays with you. Yeah. Final, final question. There's so yeah. much. This is such a good choice. And I have loved this <laughs> conversation so much. So thank you so, so much. I think it's really interesting. I wish the listeners could hear, the viewers of the YouTube can see. But it's like, it's really split. The lines, is that mm. a classic Penelope Skinner thing? To sort yes. of, she's using line breaks almost like punctuation yes yeah she does and 
she writes it at the start of some of her plays, but she also explained it to us that a line without a full stop at the end means the thought is unfinished. Mm-hmm. That's and helpful. the a new line means that the character has had to find a way to say that. They've had to think about what they want to say next. So she gave us those little tidbits of, this is how I've heard it in my head. And that's why it looks like that. Brilliant. I have loved this. Thank you so much, Jo. Thank this you has been so much. Just the best. I've thoroughly enjoyed this incredibly depressing speech. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Hear Me Out is a Lucy Eaton Productions podcast. Music composed by Tristan Kay and artwork by Rebecca Bright. Our heartfelt thanks to the estates and license holders that allow us to read our guests' speech choices. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please, please subscribe, rate, and review. You can follow us on social media at Pod Hear Me Out and enjoy visual clips of the interviews on our YouTube channel. Finally, if you would like to support Hear Me Out, go ahead and click the Patreon link at the bottom of the episode bios. 